Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaya Motter, and I'm a publisher at Elsevier. I would like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Studying Laser Microirradiation Induced DNA Damage and Repair Using Live Cell Microscopy, which is being hosted by the journal DNA Repair. We want to extend a special thank you to our sponsor at Andor Technology for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's speaker, Dr. Akash Gunjan. Dr. Gunjan is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Florida State University's College of Medicine. Before Dr. Gunjan begins, I would like to remind the audience that we will have a question and answer session following the presentation. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask button at the right-hand corner of your screen. I would encourage you to input your questions as and when you think of them. These will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end, and the more questions we get, uh, the more interactive this session will be. So without further delay, I would like to hand over to Dr. Gunjan to begin his presentation. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, this is Dr. Gunjan, and welcome to today's webinar on using laser microirradiation to study DNA damage and repair by live cell microscopy. Um, so I'll begin right away by um, first outlining the objectives of uh, today's webinar, and I'll mainly try to provide you with a general overview of the use of live cell imaging to study DNA damage and repair, and I'm going to talk briefly about some of the uh, latest technological innovations that have occurred in the last few years uh, that I believe will be driving live cell imaging to um, new heights and result in novel discoveries. I'm going to also provide some general schemes for studying a variety of DNA damage and repair related questions uh, using live cell microscopy and laser microirradiation. And um, I'm going to try and provide you with a balanced view of this technology and discuss the many advantages and also some of the disadvantages of using this technique to study DNA damage and repair. And finally, I'll leave you with a demonstration of how we can use this technology to study DNA repair processes under hypoxia. And I'll talk more about hypoxia to the end of today's webinar. So for the uninitiated into the field of DNA damage and repair, I would just like to point out that the DNA in all organisms is under constant um, threat of attack from DNA damaging agents, which can be broadly um, defined uh, into two categories, the external DNA damaging agents and the endogenous DNA damaging agents. The external DNA damaging agents are agents that are present all around us in our environment, and they can vary from um, X-rays and gamma rays that are part of cosmic irradiation coming in from deep in the universe uh, to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are present as atmospheric pollutants. and um, um, there are different other kinds of chemicals that can cause a variety of DNA damage in our cells. And so, for example, X-rays and gamma rays can cause single-strand breaks or double-strand breaks, which are repaired by uh, homologous recombination-mediated repair or end-joining-mediated repair. Uh, single-strand breaks can also be repaired by base excision repair pathway. Um, Apart from these um, external agents like X-rays and gamma rays, uh, as well as UV light that's present in the sunlight, which can cause um, different kinds of um, photo damage, including 6-4 photo products, cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers, shown here in the form of a thymine dimer, which are repaired by nucleotide excision repair. Um, apart from these external agents are Cellular metabolism also produces byproducts such as free oxygen uh, radicals, and these can cause oxidative base damage, such as the formation of 8-oxoguanine eight, eight and so on, which are repaired by base excision repair. Um, another endogenous source of DNA damage is the process of DNA replication itself. Although replication generally occurs with very high fidelity, um, and our genomes are duplicated um, uh, on a regular basis, but this requires the help of 
uh, proofreading mechanisms and repair mechanisms to catch any mistakes. And these mistakes actually occur quite commonly, and they can be in the form of base pair mismatches or insertion and deletions due to polymerase errors during um, S phase. And these kinds of errors are repaired by mismatch repair. So there are multiple exogenous and endogenous sources of DNA damage and they cause a variety of DNA damage, and these are repaired by a variety of repair pathways. Now, what happens when cells experience DNA damage? Well, depending upon which phase of the cell cycle they are in, uh, cells stop cell cycle progression, um, and this is typically transiently, and this is believed to allow the cells time to repair the DNA damage before they progress back into the cell cycle. Um, now, normally, um, the cells will stop progressing, and this will also stop uh, both replication and chromosome segregation because you really don't want a cell that has DNA damage to try and replicate its genome and then try to segregate its chromosomes because then you can transmit these instances of DNA damage to the daughter cells, which would not be a good thing. Um, and typically, cells depending upon the degree of damage, will be able to repair the damage and then re-enter the cell cycle. However, in cases where they are unable to repair the damage or the damage is too massive, um, then the cells are pre-programmed to undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and cells basically commit suicide to avoid um, any deleterious problems later on. And these deleterious problems could be uh, in the form of mutations and chromosomal aberrations that result when cells either do not efficiently repair the DNA um, and also at the same time fail to undergo apoptosis and then go on to divide um, with the DNA damage, thereby passing it on to the daughter cells. And this can contribute to cancer in the future, it can contribute to aging, and it can lead to uh, hereditary diseases in the progeny. So the consequences of inefficiently or improperly repaired DNA are quite significant. Hence, we need a really good and flexible method for studying DNA damage and repair. And I believe this is where uh, lysol imaging and laser microirradiation using the current tools can play a major role. So. I'll start by talking about some of the advantages of using laser microirradiation to study <clears throat> DNA damage and repair. Um, first of all, laser microirradiation can be used to generate all the major kinds of DNA damage that I just talked about, single strand breaks, double strand breaks, mismatches, and um, uh, UV-type damage, base damage. They're all caused by laser microirradiation, depending upon the exact laser wavelength and so on, you can actually um, focus more on one type of damage than on other types of damage. And uh, um, so you can pick your laser wavelength for causing the damage accordingly. Um, you can watch the entire repair process from beginning to end and even continue to follow the cells after they have finished uh, repairing the DNA as they go through multiple cell cycles. Um, and uh, uh, modern live cell imaging allows us with the tools to do that. Um, live cell imaging is particularly suitable for looking at the sequential recruitment of repair factors in real time to the sites of DNA damage. And although they are biochemical means, which may allow the study of um, the sequential recruitment of repair factors, they may not be sensitive enough to look or, or detect very small differences in the recruitment timing of different factors. So for example, um, if factor A gets recruited 30 seconds after DNA damage occurs and factor B is recruited 45 seconds after DNA damage occurs, um, Biochemical techniques such as chromatin immunoprecipitation and so on will be very difficult in, will find it very difficult to detect such small differences, which are very real and significant differences, but lysol imaging will very easily allow you to study those kind of differences. Um, lysol imaging allows you to measure the kinetics of repair factor recruitment and then follow its dynamics, both in the absence and presence of DNA damage, 
And more importantly, live cell imaging um, allows you to cause damage in specific nuclear compartments. So you can choose to call, cause damage in the euchromatin, in the heterochromatin, in the nucleoli, and so on, and watch whether there are differences in um, DNA repair in those different compartments. And um, unlike many biochemical strategies that are used to study DNA damage and repair, if you wanted to look for um, or if you wanted to study DNA repair in specific phases of the cell cycle, you would first need to synchronize the cells in that phase of the cell cycle, which could be G1 or G2M or S phase before you can proceed with your experiment. Whereas with live cell imaging, you can just use cell cycle, well-known cell cycle markers to stage or detect cells that are in a mixed population or asynchronous population of cells under the microscope and then pick specific cells to carry out your analysis. So in a single experiment, you can find S phase, um, G2 cells, G1 cells, and carry out your damage in those cells and follow repair and see if there are differences between uh, different phases of the cell cycle. And I'm not going to go through all the different uh, different advantages um, in, in detail, but you know these strategies can be very easily scaled up for high throughput screening uh, to detect novel DNA repair factors. And also, uh, as opposed to using other sources of DNA damage um, in the lab, which could be ionizing radiation or harmful chemicals that we can potentially expose ourselves to in the lab um, while doing DNA damage um, type experiments. Laser microirradiation is typically well contained, or con you know, well contained, and within the microscope, it's all you know, it can be all put away in a box. So you never have any real danger of exposing yourself accidentally to. Uh, laser irradiation. So moving right along, um, um, I'll first show you the general scheme that most people use these days to study laser-induced DNA damage and repair by live cell microscopy. So you start out with a cell uh, that is expressing your favorite protein that you're interested in studying. Uh, that carry the fluorescent tag on it. And in this case, you know, I put down green fluorescent protein that is very commonly used, uh, GFP for short. And in this case, most um, repair proteins are typically found in the nucleus, only the nucleus of the cell is shown over here. You take the cell and then you fire um, DNA, you, you fire a laser to cause DNA damage at a very small spot, a very localized spot. We typically pick a diffraction limited spot, roughly about um, 250 nanometers in diameter to cause a DNA damage, but we can cause DNA damage in all sorts of patterns, and you can write your initials in there or write all kinds of letters and words inside the nucleus of a cell, and you can play around with it, and you know, one of those examples was on my title slide. Um, but uh, anyway, get back, getting back to this, um, you can pick the laser wavelength, cause the damage, and then keep imaging to watch as the cells recruit the DNA repair protein to the site of damage. And uh, usually we'll also see that there's a little bit of a loss of signal in the rest of the nucleus as more and more protein get recruited to the site of DNA damage. And then you can continue imaging until the protein leaves the site of uh, DNA damage after uh, its job at the site is done, and then it diffuses back into the nucleus. And a real experiment is shown over here where we have used PARP1 GFP. PARP1 is poly ADP ribose polymerase 1. It has high affinity for single strand breaks, and here we are causing um, damage with a 405 nanometer laser. And this is the cell before the damage, and that's where we are aiming the laser. This is three minutes after damage, and this is 15 minutes after we cause uh, laser microirradiation-induced damage. Um, so although we are showing uh, the recruitment three minutes after damage, this recruitment actually happens within milliseconds, um, and it reaches a peak very quickly within a minute or two. Um, and by 15 minutes after damage, the protein has already done its job and has already left, and you can see it's dispersed throughout the nucleus once again. The bright spot that you see over here is, uh, is the nucleolus that where this protein tends to accumulate um, when, when we express it. So this is the general outline for pretty much all DNA damage uh, um, experiments that people perform using laser microirradiation, and there are many variations on this theme that you can um, adopt to um, answer questions that you are interested in. 
So I'm going to go next um, to provide you with a brief historical timeline of how laser irradiation was used, uh, was developed as a tool for studying DNA repair and how it has influenced what we are doing with this technology now. Um, so um, you might be surprised to find out that um, actually the, f the first instance where um, researchers used um, laser microirradiation to cause DNA damage was uh, over 30 years ago uh, by Kramer's group, and they used Chinese hamster lung cells and used a UV laser at 257 nanometers wavelength to cause UV type damage, which they then detected using antibodies that could detect UV photo lesions, and that is shown over here. And um, although they didn't have live cell microscopy um, technology of the kind that we do now, they were able to carry out immunofluorescence type experiments to visualize those damage over here. Um, Kramer and colleagues continued to use this technology over the next decade, although it didn't really catch on for almost uh, 20 years, really. And in between, um, these two instances, uh, Limoli and Ward developed um, or discovered a method for um, for causing double strand breaks using UV uh, radiation, and this kind of generated uh, a technique that was used for many of the subsequent uh, DNA repair. Um, experiments using uh, microscopy-based assays. And what they found was that if you were to incorporate bromodeoxyuridine into the DNA and also allowed the binding of a minor group binding drug uh, known as uh, Herxt into the DNA, you could presensitize the cells to, um, uh, to suffering significant amounts of DNA damage once they were exposed to UVA light. And they found a fairly linear dependence on the amount of BRDU incorporation as well as the concentration of the Hux dye that was used uh, in terms of the number of double strand breaks generated. And in fact, if they left out the, the Hux dye or the BRDU or the UV radiation, they did not detect any double strand breaks. Um, so the next big advance, and really the modern age of um, using laser microirradiation as a tool to study DNA damage and repair, uh, started with Bill Bonner's group, who basically took the, um, the method developed by Limoli and Ward um, for causing double strand breaks after presensitization of cells with BRDU and Herx, um, and simply swapped out the UV lamp for a UV laser, which was part of um, laser micro scissors that were commercially available around that time. And um, as you can see in this um, image taken from their publication from 1999, the upper panel is showing cells that had been presensitized with both uh, BRDU incorporation as well as hook dye. And it may be a little bit hard to see, but um, you know they've got three different laser tracks that were exposed to 1% laser power, 10% laser power, or 30% laser power. And the yellow color is, um, is uh, corresponding to gamma H2X, which is a very well-known marker for DNA double strand breaks. And as you can see, there's not that much of a difference between 1%, 10%, and 30%. Uh, in fact, it almost appears that 1% causes more damage here. And so, uh, they also repeated the experiment by leaving out the BRDU and use only the Hooks DNA uh, binding dye. And in this case, um, they now saw a better dose dependence uh, uh, in, the da in the amount of damage that they were getting where they saw little or no damage at 1% and 10% and started seeing very precise damage across, uh, along the laser path at 30% uh, laser power. And they actually concluded in the paper in the paper that to limit DNA damage to more defined regions, it may be more appropriate to omit BRDU and use higher laser power settings. And we'll come back to this issue in a minute. The next year, the same group um, went ahead and demonstrated that um, 
the laser uh, micro irradiation um, of the type they had used the previous year did indeed result in formation of genuine double strand breaks and uh, double strand break repair factors were recruited. Uh, you can see gamma H2x over here on the left and RAD50 on the right, uh, which is a homologous recombination protein. BRCA1, the breast cancer susceptibility gene one, which is also a homologous recombination factor is shown here on the right again. And the double strand break repair protein NBS1, uh, Nymegan breakage syndrome one, is shown over here on the left. And so several of these factors were recruited to sites of UV laser induced double strand breaks. Um, in between 2000 and 2004, there were several groups that used life cell imaging to study DNA damage and repair, uh, with the exception that they did not use um, UV laser or any laser to cause a DNA damage. They were, in fact, using a porous filter through which they would shine UV light to cause damage in cells in specific patterns, and then they would follow their repair by microscopy. And several Dutch groups obtained a lot of valuable information using this technique. Um, but the first real example of uh, the combination of laser micro radiation and live cell imaging uh, to be reported was uh, by uh, Claudia Lucas and her group in 2004. And in this case, they use laser irradiation followed by very rapid live cell imaging to follow the recruitment of NBS1 tagged with yellow fluorescent protein or YFP and MDC1 tagged with the green fluorescent protein. And since they overlap significantly in their emission spectra, um, uh, GFP and YFP are normally hard to distinguish from each other. But they use spectral unmixing techniques to clearly show that um, in real time, the recruitment of NBS1 occurs a lot sooner than the recruitment of MDC1 to DNA uh, double strand breaks. Um, the following year, uh, Mortusevich uh, et al. for the first time used solid state diode lasers at 405 nanometers to cause double strand breaks. And so this basically runs the gamut of um, the major technologies and the major innovations that we have seen in the field of laser micro irradiation um, and life cell imaging to um, study DNA repair and sets the stage for what I'm going to talk about um, talk about today. So although these studies were pioneering and obtained a lot of valuable information of different kinds, um, they face several limitations primarily due to the technology that was available at that time. Um, the first limitation was um, the lasers that were typically um, associated with microscopes um, during that period were not powerful enough and required pre-sensitization of cells with BRDU or um, DNA intercalating dyes such as sorolin or DNA minor group binding dyes such as HUX. And these dyes can alter chromatin structure. And since DNA damage and repair occurs on a chromatin template in eukaryotes, it can significantly alter the results. And especially for, for our lab, we study chromatin structure and function. So if we want to study DNA repair um, uh, in the context of chromatin, it wouldn't be a good idea for us to use use these intercalating dyes. So this became a priority for us to optimize the conditions under which we can cause DNA damage using laser micro irradiation without any pre-sensitization of cells whatsoever. And we'll come back to this in, in a minute again. Um, many of the microscopes and uh, uh, digital cameras that were available during uh, these studies were not fast enough to record rapid kinetics of recruitment. We know now that uh, certain factors are recruited very quickly following damage and as, as soon as one millisecond after uh, the DNA damaging laser pulse is fired. Um, and uh, um, many of these experiments were performed on uh, confocal microscopes, and these typically use uh, point scanners, which expose the cells to a fairly high amount of laser power during imaging. And um, the subsequent photo bleaching and phototoxicity due to this higher laser power limited the length of the experiments. Uh, the length of the experiments were also limited by um, the 
absence of good autofocus um, uh, controls on microscopes to prevent the loss of focus that occurs uh, during long-term imaging. Further, the number of fluorescent proteins that were available during that time were really limited, primarily limited to maybe GFP and red fluorescent protein RFP. Um, although YFP and BFP were available, uh, sometimes if you want to use uh, three different colors to follow three different proteins at the same time, you couldn't do it because uh, you didn't have the appropriate spectral unmixing capabilities on your system and so on. Um, the good news is that a lot of these uh, technological issues have been solved in the last few years, and technology has really provided us with, uh, has provided us with very good tools now to carry out DNA damage and repair experiments uh, um, using laser micro radiation and follow them by live cell microscopy. And the first of these developments are the availability of uh, small, portable, very stable, um, solid state lasers, so diode based solid state lasers. And the advantage that they have is uh, they provide higher laser power. And so in most cases uh, that we have tried, we do not need any pre-sensitization ourselves whatsoever for uh, causing DNA damage of various kinds. So that was, uh, that was a big uh, advantage with these lasers. Further, these lasers are small. They are literally maintenance free. They're long lasting. And they see very little fluctuation in their power output. So all of these were very important for the kind of experiments that we would like to do with uh, laser irradiation. Uh, the next big uh, development was the, the invention of electron mul multiplying CCD cameras. These are digital cameras that are capable of theoretically detecting single photons, so they're very sensitive under low light conditions. They're also very fast, and um, many of the, the newer cameras can go up to 1,000 frames a second. So uh, you can record very fast um, kinetics after you cause DNA damage and follow your protein of interest. Uh, and the fact that they are they're very sensitive under low light conditions means that you need very little laser power to image uh, um, your uh, samples with these cameras. And in fact, these cameras are also the same kind that are currently being used to try and detect faint objects in the universe um, um, by different laboratories. The third technology that has been a boon for live cell imaging is the incorporation of spinning disk technology. Now, spinning disk technology has been around for many decades, uh, but only in the last decade or so it, uh, it has been uh, really um, incorporated um, in a functional manner with laser confocal microscopy. And so if, uh, if you're familiar with confocal microscopy and a, and a point scanner, the spinning disk technology basically, instead of using a point scanner, it basically passes a laser through two spinning disks, which has multiple pinholes that are aligned to each other. And each of those pinholes acts as a micro lens, and it allows the scanning of a much larger area of the sample at the same time using lower laser power. So lower laser power means low phototoxicity toxicity and photo bleaching, and plus the scanning rate is much faster. So again, that reduces the amount of laser exposure. So um, the next um, technological innovation has been the development of infrared LED-based um, autofocus systems that are becoming more and more common on live cell microscopes. And these, um, uh, some of these are really so good that uh, you are more likely to run out of media and your cells are more likely to outgrow the available surface area uh, uh, for growth before they are going to go out of focus. So these are extremely good and we have uh, used them to stay in focus and image over several days at a time. Um, also, uh, during this period, um, people have developed better and better environmental chambers and closures, stage stop inserts for the microscopes that allow you to maintain the desired growth, growth conditions as well as change them in a dynamic manner if you want to. 
Um, and last but not least, the number of fluorescent proteins that have uh, become available over the years now are about 100 proteins or so, and many of these have vastly improved properties over the ones that uh, people had been using several years ago, and so you can do a lot more with them and follow m multiple proteins of interest, tag with different fluorescent proteins in the same experiment at the same time. So um, let's just look at some of the basic things that um, um, studying DNA damage with laser microirradiation and following it with lysol imaging will involve. Well, first of all, you need an inverted microscope as shown over here, and you need either a stage shop incubator or an environmental chamber of some sort to keep your cells nice and happy, provide them with the right kind of um, gas mixtures and uh, temperature control that they need. Um, then if you're going to do live cell imaging, um, you would want a spinning disk to kind of reduce photo <coughs> bleaching and phototoxicity uh, during your, your experiments. And of course, that will also be aided by an EMCCD camera that is very sensitive, so you need very low amounts of light uh, to um, image your samples. Of course, for long-term um, uh, long imaging, as I pointed out, you need some autofocus system, uh, which is very, very handy for doing um, imaging over multiple days. And if you plan on doing that, that will be a good thing to have on your scope. And of course, you need a unit to be able to steer the, the lasers that I'm going to talk about next. Um, this is typically a Galvo-driven um, uh, system to steer the laser and al allow you to uh, fire the laser and cause the damage exactly where you want it to. Um, and then, of course, you need lasers both for imaging as well as for causing the DNA damage. You can go with either gas-based lasers, which are more traditional, or the solid-state lasers, which um, we use most of the time now. And you can pick any number of uh, lasers of different wavelengths, depending upon what you're interested in studying. Um, so these are basically some of the, the components that you're going to need on a system. The good news is that most departments uh, across the world have at least one confocal microscope in the department that's, uh, uh, that's available for general use. And in many cases, uh, most of these units can be retrofitted with some of these additional newer components um, to convert it into something that you can use readily for studying uh, laser microirradiation induced DNA damage and repair by live cell imaging. Um, and it doesn't cost that much to do so. I mean, it's not like getting a whole new system. So um, to begin with, let me give you some examples of how we carry out our DNA damage with laser microirradiation without any pre-sensitization of cells with DNA binding dyes and so on. So the upper um, panel shows um, the protein PCNA um, tag with RFP. PCNA stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and it is a replication clamp, replicative clamp. And as the name implies, this is a trimeric protein that um, has a donut shape. It opens up and clamps around the DNA uh, whenever replication is required. So whenever any amount of DNA needs to be synthesized, PCNA needs to be there. And so we use PCNA as a marker for active repair. And um, we are causing DNA damage, in this case, with a 405 nanometer solid state laser. We have a 100 milliwatt laser. And we typically fire it at a diffraction limited uh, 0.25 micron spot between 1 and 10 milliseconds of irradiation at that spot at 100% power. And we've actually measured uh, the power with just a handheld uh, meter, and it's uh, roughly 90 microwatts coming out of the objective. That doesn't really mean that that's what is um, uh, impacting on the actual sample, because you do expect to get further loss before it actually hits the sample. That's just what comes out of the objective. And we found for the 405 nanometer uh, laser, we get the most consistent results with uh, 100x turf um, uh, objective with a very high numerical aperture of 1.49. Uh, bear in mind that 1.51 is the theoretical maximum that you can get in terms of numerical apertures. So let's go and play this movie to see what happens. 
Excuse me. So you see we fired this laser within this area denoted over here and you can see the recruitment of PCNA um, to this area very rapidly. And um, this response is very consistent between one cell to another expressing PCNA RFP. We have not really found any differences in terms of the recruitment kinetics based on the tag that we put on PCNA and I'll show you a couple of examples there. Um, and we can cause multiple instances of damage within the cell as in this case. Um, let me see if the movie will come up. It should give me the controls in a minute. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. And so in this case, we are firing the laser twice, and you may be able to see that they both come up at exactly the same time. So whether we cause one instance of damage or four instances of uh, damage in the same cell, the recruitment kinetics remain pretty much the same. So this allows a very, very consistent um, system, very, very consistent assay um, to measure other proteins um, to, so typically we'll use PCNA RFP as a control in just about all of our experiments. Uh, sometimes we use other proteins as well, but this is a very good example of something that you can use as a control in your experiments when you're starting out. Uh, the lower panel shows the damage due to 365 nanometer pulse UV laser. This is the kind of the traditional laser that many people would use to cause uh, laser microwave radiation use DNA damage. And in this case, uh, the only thing that you need to watch out for is that you have to pick an objective that allows very high UV transmittance. You want most of the light from the laser to be transmitted through the objective, and not all objectives are equally good at transmitting UV light, so that's something to be aware of. In this case, we are looking at the recruitment of NBS1 GFP. I should get the movie controls in just a second. There we go. And you can see the recruitment is occurring over here. It's very rapid recruitment. And on the right over here, we have another protein, CAF1, which is chromatin assembly factor 1. It's a protein involved in chromatin assembly. It's a PCNA binding protein. And in fact, it is recruited by uh, PCNA to DNA damage sites. And um, this is the same cell in which we are looking at NBS1 and CAF1 M cherry. And I'll show you that typically it takes longer for CAF1 to appear than it does NBS. And I can scroll back a little bit and then show you that NBS is there in less than a minute. And CAF1 takes about twice as long to start appearing, so or you know about 30 more seconds to start appearing. And these are the kind of differences between different repair factors that you can study using life cell microscopy, but not necessarily by biochemical techniques, because you know a difference of 30 seconds or 60 seconds is not something that is easy to distinguish using biochemical methods. So I also pointed out that you can use live cell microscopy to study DNA damage in, in cells that are in different phases at the same time in the same experiment. And this is kind of illustrated over here. PCNA RFP shows very distinct distribution in the um, cells depending upon whether the cells are in S phase or whether they are in in interphase. So in S phase, PCNA being a replicated, uh, replicated protein is localized to the sites of DNA replication and gives rise to this punctate um, pattern, whereas it shows a much more homogeneous, smooth appearance in cells that are not in S phase. And there are these four cells that are not in S phase. And just to show how consistent um, the response to DNA damage is from one cell to another, I'm going to play this movie. And what you will notice is that the cells that are not in S phase all recruit at pretty much exactly the same time for the same amount of DNA damage, whereas the S phase cell behaves a little bit differently. So let me start this movie and let you watch what I'm trying to convey here. So as you can see over here, all these force interface cells develop the repair force I at the damage side at pretty much exactly the same time. I can scroll back and show you that that's indeed the case. So 
that's about 13 seconds after damage and you can clearly see all the four forming the repair foci. Not so in the case of the S phase cell. It does develop a foci but it takes quite a bit longer. So we're now at around 30 seconds and now you're finally starting to see the repair foci forming in the S phase cell. And we believe this is because BCNA, which is already engaged in replicating DNA, needs to disengage from some of the replication factories and then come to the site of DNA damage. And that's illustrated over here. And so now you can see it. So it does catch up with the other guys, uh, just takes a little bit longer for it to do so. And this is just an example. You can actually now use specific markers for different phases of the cell cycle. And these are fluorescent markers, so you can spot which cells are in S versus G1 versus G2, something uh, by using uh, something like the commercially available Fuji system now, and then you can pick individual cells to carry out your DNA um, damage and repair experiments. And I'm also using different um, uh, cell lines in these examples just to show you that you know, altering the cell lines across a variety of mammalian species does not significantly alter your results. The kinetics in one cell line that we see are fairly comparable to kinetics in you know, a very different species. So this is Chinese hamster ovary cells, which show very similar kinetics to human cells. So what kind of quantitative information can we obtain from these uh, kinds of experiments? So in this case, I'm showing you PCNA, this time tagged with uh, CFP, or the cyan fluorescent protein. And um, the first thing we can uh, measure is the recruitment kinetics of this protein to DNA damage site. And we do that by measuring the change in fluorescent intensity over time at the DNA damage spot. So um, on the y-axis, we've got fluorescence intensity uh, in 100 arbitrary unit steps. On the, uh, the x-axis, we have time in 20-second intervals. And as you can see over here, prior to the damage, there's a certain amount of fluorescence at the damage spot. When we fire the DNA damaging pulse over here, there's a sudden drop in fluorescence at that spot, and that is due to photobleaching due to the DNA damaging pulse. And recruitment starts pretty much right away. So this is the recruitment phase, and uh, this occurs until it reaches a max at around um, 120 seconds, about two minutes after the damage. And then it kind of plateaus out and kind of stays there for a little while before starting to come down once repair uh, is completed. And so that reaches, uh, you know, so at this point, it reaches a plateau stage, which is basically uh, an equilibrium between the rate at which the protein is being recruited there, the rate at which it is being ro uh, lost from the DNA damage site, and also there's some contribution due to photo bleaching itself. So let's watch the movie over here. Um, that's right in the center over there. We cause the damage, and then we start measuring the fluorescence intensity, which increases over time. So all the movies that I've shown you so far have been imaging cells in a single confocal plane roughly in the middle of the cell where we have been causing the damage. But when we cause damage, when we fire a laser, the damage doesn't occur in 2D. It doesn't just occur in X and Y planes. It also occurs in Z planes. So the damage actually occurs in 3D. And so when we are imaging in a single plane, we can sometimes lose the, lose the information about how much damage occurred in the Z direction up and down the cell, going up and down the cell. So we can easily study that by imaging in 4D, which is in X, Y, and Z directions over time. That's 4D imaging. And what we have over here is a series of confocal sections going up and down the cell. So the cell will first come into focus and then go out of focus as, a, as you go up and down the confocal sections. This is before we cause the damage. So I should get the movie controls in a second here. There it is. And as you can see, you're going up and down the cell and you can see the cell coming into focus and out of focus, and there's no, no um, instance of damage here. And this is one minute after damage in the same cell. And you can see that at a certain point, you start seeing the damage site. And so I'm going to stop and just 
briefly tell you how you can use this 3D information to get uh, some idea about your damaged foci. So uh, we're taking half a micron uh, confocal slices over here. And so by looking at how many different sections you have the signal on, and let me see if I can get my movie controls back here again and go back. Uh, there we go. And so if I go back, it's not there. It's there, one section two and three, and it's gone. So just by measuring the number of different confocal sections where we do see the DNA damage signal, we can figure out roughly how big the DNA damage foci is. In this case, it's roughly 1.5 microns uh, in, di in diameter. So the damage side is about 1.5 microns. Let me see if I can get my controls here again. OK, and let me go back. There we go. So I'll leave it at that. So that's typically the damage that you would observe about one minute after the da uh, after firing the laser. And this is just a maximum intensity projection movie where we follow it in 4D over time. And you can see that the spot does keep getting bigger over time. So by the time uh, of uh, maximum accumulation of PCNA at the damaged site, it would be roughly about 2 to 2.5 microns in size um, after a damaging pulse that hit about 250 nanometers. So this is the way we can actually compute not just fluorescence intensity in a single plane over time, but we can actually get some volume information about how much DNA may be potentially involved in generating the signal and what is the size of the DNA damage by counting the voxels involved. And there are many different software now, such as MRS, which you can use to render these movies in many different ways to compute the volume uh, involved in the DNA, at the DNA damage site. So we can modify the traditional scheme for causing DNA damage and repair um, in different ways to get additional information about the proteins that we are interested in. And so in this case, we are combining a DNA uh, uh, damage experiment uh, using laser microradiation with uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching of FRAP experiment to determine the dynamics of the DNA repair protein at DNA repair sites versus non repair sites. So you carry out DNA damage, you watch the protein as it becomes recruited to the damaged site, and then once maximal recruitment is attained and it reaches steady state, you fire a different laser, a 488 nanometer laser, to photo bleach both the DNA damage site where it had recruited the repair protein, as well as an unrelated site where there was no previous DNA damage. And then you photo bleach it, so you'll see two black holes in an otherwise green homogeneous staining background. And then you watch as the green signal is recovered in these two spots. And you can measure the rate at which the signal is recovered at the undamaged spot as well as the damaged spot. And in many instances, you will find that at the damaged spot, the repair protein takes longer to recover the green signal. And that basically indicates that the repair protein is less mobile here. It's actually actively involved in carrying out the repair. And so it takes a while for it to be recovered over there, since once you photo bleach, a GFP molecule, it does not regain its fluorescence. The only way to get fluorescence back, back in this area is if a different GFP molecule moves into this area. And that will only happen when the bleach molecule leaves that area and is replaced by an unbleached molecule. Uh, and typically, the recovery at undamaged uh, uh, regions of the same nucleus are much faster. So this can give you important information about the dynamics of your protein uh, during DNA damage and, uh, and uh, in the absence of DNA damage. We can also take, uh, take advantage of recently developed photoactivable uh, uh, fluorescent proteins, which basically turn on or off depending upon the, the light that is sh shown on them or photoswitchable or photoconvertible fluorescent proteins. Now, photoconvertible photo, uh, uh, fluorescent proteins are also known as optical highlighters. And these can photoconvert from one color to another. And as uh, the writing over here implies, uh, this, this particular protein can photoconvert from green 
to red, and this is an irreversible uh, photoconversion. And now there are some proteins that are being made available that allow reversible photoconversion as well. But anyway, so one such protein is the dendra protein, and this dendra protein um, is normally green and fluoresces uh, in the uh, in the green uh, region of the spectra, just like GFP. And you can basically excite it like GFP, and it will give rise to green fluorescence, shown over here. However, if you shine low amounts of 4 or 5 nanometer laser light on half of the nucleus over here, it can convert the green fluorescence to a red fluorescence, and this is an irreversible conversion. Green can convert to red, but red cannot convert back to green for dendra. And so only way to get the green color back over here is if the green color moves from here to here or if new uh, dendra molecules are synthesized, which will be green uh, in color. And once you've carried this photoconversion, then you can carry out DNA damage in both the red part of the um, of the nucleus as well as the green part of the nucleus and watch whether the protein that is recruited or recovered there is red in color or green in color. Um, and so if your protein has very limited mobility, you might just recover green in the green part of the nucleus and red in the red part of the nucleus. Or you can recruit a mixture of the two, which would suggest that your protein is fairly mobile after DNA damage. Or you can end up recruiting nothing, which would mean that your protein is largely immobile after DNA damage. And in fact, um, uh, this particular strategy can be used very well to study uh, DNA damage and repair uh, um, um, activities of proteins that are typically not very mobile in the nucleus. So a uh, much more recent um, advance, uh, technological advance, has been the commercial availability of numerous microfluidic systems that are highly amenable um, to a life cell imaging. And I'm showing a picture of one such microfluidic chamber, which has the typical dimensions of a microtiter plate. And in, um, in towards the middle of this plate is a glass bottom area that contains four culture chambers um, for for growth of cells in these chambers and imaging, life cell imaging of these chambers. And these culture chambers are supplied with cells that come in from the right, from these wells over here, they come in over here. And from the left, these set of wells over here supply nutrients and other reagents that you want to treat your cells with. And these four chambers can be simultaneously used for carrying out four replicates of an experiment, four different experimental setups, or one control and three different experimental setups, and you know various permutations and combinations. Additional flexibility is allowed by these wells on the left over here, where there are series of six wells that supply each of these chambers. And so you can put uh, growth media in one, a different kind of growth media in the next well, an inhibitor in the third well, maybe a higher concentration of inhibitor in the fourth well, and so on. And you can pre-program the release of these uh, solutions into this chamber at certain times while you're imaging continuously. So this allows for a very, very flexible way to study DNA damage and repair under under dynamic conditions where uh, you can add inhibitors, wash off inhibitors, change nutrient conditions such as low glucose, high glucose, or perfuse um, the cells with media containing high oxygen or low oxygen. And in fact, that is one of the experiments that I'm going to show you now where we have looked at what happens to DNA damage and, uh, and repair under conditions of low oxygen or hypoxia. So before I tell you about that specific experiment, I'll just briefly talk about why studying hypoxia is important. Now, we have known for many decades that uh, solid tumors, such as the one depicted in the cotton over here, have very good supply of blood vessels on the outside, which means the cells on the outside are well supplied with both oxygen and nutrients for their growth and division. However, the cells in the interior core of such solid tumors 
are poorly supplied by blood vessels and as such they are quite often exposed to prolonged periods of very low oxygen conditions, often low nutrient conditions and so on. And these cells either die or they adapt over time and when they adapt, these cells have found to become very, very resistant to most DNA damage causing um, agents. And since many DNA damage causing agents are used uh, clinically as anti-cancer agents, this has been a major problem in treating solid tumors because these hypoxic uh, cells in the core of tumors are very difficult to kill using traditional anti-cancer DNA damage causing drugs. And so several uh, reasons have been put forth as to why these cells are so difficult to kill. One could simply be that, you know, they are not supplied with enough blood vessels. So when you treat uh, the patient with uh, chemotherapeutics, these drugs do not reach the cells and hence there's no effect of these drugs on these cells. Um, Another explanation could be that these cells have adapted over time to become more effective at repairing the any DNA damage that they incur, and as such, they are very resistant to DNA damaging agents. And a third possibility is that uh, these cells are just just very resistant to DNA damaging <coughs> um, to DNA damaging um, drugs under um, uh, over, uh, you know under hypoxic. Uh, conditions. And so we decided to test these ideas, and this is just an example to show you how you can devise, um, devise ways and experiments to address very specific questions. So we've addressed this question uh, using a live cell microscopy system, and the upper panel shows the recruitment of PowerPoint GFP and PCNA. The right panel over here simply shows the overlap of the red and the green signals, and, uh, and this is under normal conditions where the cells are being grown under atmospheric oxygen, which is about roughly 20% oxygen. And so if I play this movie, you'll see that within about 15 seconds, you see recruitment of PARP1, Within, in the same frame, you see recruitment of PCNA, and you see recruitment of both these proteins, and you can see that they are co-localizing over here. And this was when we fired the UV laser just once at that spot, at a diffraction-limited spot. When we grew the cells for 18 hours under hypoxic conditions, and hypoxia is basically uh, defined as oxygen concentrations of 2% or lower. And after 18 hours of hypoxia, 2% oxygen, and then we carry out the same experiment. And in this case, we actually fired the laser three times at the same spot. And there you go. And so now 15 seconds, nothing. 30 seconds, nothing. A minute, nothing. Two minutes, nothing, four minutes, something is starting to happen. And only by around four or five minutes, we start seeing a little bit of recruitment here. Um, and it's the same thing with the recruitment of PCNA. It takes a long time to be recruited here. And we observe the same thing over here in the overlay. Whereas if we were to allow this, and this to play till the end, you'll see how bright the signals are over here. And so compared to normal conditions and the hypoxic conditions, we see very little recruitment, even though we have caused at least three times as much damage at the same spots. We see very poor recruitment. Now, one explanation for this could be uh, that the cells will not recruit these proteins and the hypoxia conditions, even though they have uh, incurred significant DNA damage. Uh, but we know that that's not really true from some other biochemical uh, experiments, which clearly suggest that under hypoxic conditions, cells just do not suffer enough DNA damage. So this is just an example of how you can use these technology to address questions that are highly relevant to human health and disease. So um, I'm almost at the end of... Uh, my webinar over here, and I'll just briefly mention some of the disadvantage, uh, uh, disadvantages associated with uh, um, studying la laser microradiation-induced DNA damage by live cell microscopy. And most of these are related to uh, the fact that you need to generate an exogenous fluorescently tagged protein 
uh, before you can study it. And sometimes that fluorescent tag might interfere with the function of the protein, and so you have to try N-terminal fusion, C-terminal tagging, or use a linker between the protein and the tag and so on to try and come up with a version of the protein that has a fluorescent tag but will not interfere with the function, normal function of that protein. Now the next uh, disadvantage of this technique would be the fact that after you have created a fluorescently fused protein of your interest, you need to get that protein into the cells to study it. And this is typically achieved by trans transfection or by microinjection or transduction and so on. And the potential for overexpression of this fusion protein is quite high, but we found that if you carry out your experiments within 12 to 24 hours of the transfection, you typically avoid any major issues related to overexpression. Uh, we've also found that with the use of the next generation of fluorescent proteins that are much more brighter and have improved properties, such as M emerald instead of GFP, you can carry out your experiments with much lower ex uh, expression of the fusion protein. And uh, despite all our efforts, sometimes we find that some proteins really need um, that we generate a stably, uh, uh, stably transfected cell line that expresses low amounts of that protein before we can get consistent results. Uh, although more recently we found that even this can be overcome by using transfect, uh, transiently transfected cells uh, by using the flow-activated cell sorter or FACS to obtain a population of cells expressing basically the same level of the tag protein and carrying out our experiments on them. And uh, last but not least, perhaps the the biggest handicap for the use of G, uh, uh, for the use of laser, laser microradiation to study DNA damage and repair is the investment that is required. Uh, but the good news on that front is that uh, uh, the systems, uh, a basic system. Uh, could be assembled in less than $250,000 uh, now uh, from scratch uh, as opposed to at least $750,000 less than a decade ago. So, uh, and as I pointed out earlier, many departments already have a confocal microscopy system that can be uh, retrofitted with some of the other hardware and software that is required for these kind of experiments. So lastly, I would just like to end by reiterating that the recent technological advances um, have clearly generated a situation where we can take unprecedented advantage of uh, these technologies to study DNA damage and repair using live cell imaging following laser microirradiation. And the hope is that this will move the, the field forward um, in new directions and provide information that is highly relevant to human health and disease. I would like to end there by acknowledging the people that have been involved in this work, uh, particularly uh, my postdoc Rakesh Singh who has carried out bulk of the microscopy. He has recently wrapped up things in our lab and is looking for an independent position now. Sarah Burkhardt, a PhD student, has picked up the reins on this um, project where Rakesh has left off and uh, our work is facilitated by Maria Lynn Kabaj, who helps maintain and construct many of the cell lines that we use in the microscopy. Ruth Didier is the director of our four cytometry um, and microscopy facilities in the department, and without her help, nothing would be possible. In terms of the experiments that I showed, Mike Davidson is a collaborator at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, and he provides us with some of the latest source and proteins that I talked to you about. Um, and finally, of course, I have to thank Florida State University College of Medicine for providing us with such excellent imaging facilities. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, both Elsevier and Kaya, um, as well as Andor for making this webinar possible. And um, I would like to also thank the audience for being patient and for your attention. And I'm ready to handle your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganjan. Um, so we've gone a little bit over time, um, but I'd still like to allow uh, about five minutes for questions. Because, Absolutely. Uh, there have been uh, quite a few coming through. Um, so I will, and for those of you who uh, whose questions uh, we don't have time to answer, uh, Dr. Ganjan will be able to respond to you offline. Uh, we'll forward the uh, questions to him. Certainly. 
Um, so just to, just to uh, give you a few sample questions here from the batch, um, one question came in uh, asking, um, light damage in hypoxia conditions might be of a different type and or extent as compared to normal O2 conditions because DNA uh, damage is actually DNA oxidation. Certainly, yeah, that is certainly um, what our experiments indeed indicate, that uh, uh, if you do not have oxygen or, or adequate amounts of oxygen, you actually don't cause much damage because oxygen is actually an integral part of how lasers cause DNA damage or, or how any kind of um, uh, ionizing radiation also causes damage. Ionizing radiation or laser doesn't itself directly hit the DNA to cause the damage. It actually causes um, damage by striking oxygen molecules, nitrogen molecules, and generating free radicals in the vicinity of the DNA, which then attack the, the DNA to cause the damage. And as such, if you take the oxygen away, you dramatically reduce the extent of damage that uh, the cell incurs. And you can actually uh, mimic some of the same conditions of low oxygen by putting in oxygen scavengers. And once again, it becomes difficult to damage the DNA in those cells using uh, these kinds of irradiation techniques. Yep. So one, one more question. Um, I'm interested in using this system on live tissue from Drosophila. Do you know if, it, if that has been tried with this system? In case it has been, can laser be targeted accurately in the tissue to specific nuclei just as like, just like culture cells? Um, sure. I think I've heard, um, you know, of people trying to attempt that. And, um, you know, definitely um, your success is going to depend upon, you know, what kind of objective you're using. You know, since you're trying to reach deeper into the tissues, I would recommend using a, a water immersion lens, which will allow you to go a little bit deeper into the tissues. But certainly, uh, it is definitely something that can be tried, That, uh, and I know that people are trying this. And the laser, of course, uh, the, the focusing the laser uh, or targeting the laser is not really going to be the issue. The issue is going to be how deep into your sample you can reach. And, uh, um, you know, if you are... Uh, anywhere less than 200 microns or so, or between uh, 100 microns or 200 microns, you should be able to uh, still cause adequate amounts of damage to use these techniques to study um, uh, DNA damage and repair. Mm -hmm. Another question, can the DNA repair factors under laser scanning microscopy be used to identify the damaging potential of novel pharmaceutical formulations containing various drugs when incubated with various cell lines. Oh, absolutely. In fact, that's what I was trying to allude to when I showed you um, the microfluidics device, and I mentioned that we can easily scale this up to high throughput type of applications using such microfluidic devices, and uh, there are ways to, uh, you know, set it up such that you can do things in 384 uh, well plates and so on and so forth and flush it uh, in and out with different types of inhibitors, different concentrations of inhibitors and so on. It just depends upon what exactly you want to do and uh, finding or developing the right kind of hardware to uh, allow you to do that. But it is all possible and in most cases you will be able to find off-the-shelf components that you can buy from different vendors and incorporate into your current system. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, can we use this technique to trigger the nuclear epidermal growth factor that regulate DNA PK? Well, um, you know, in terms of that specific experiment, I can only say that you have to try and find out. Uh, now, DNA PK, um, uh, if you are trying to observe DNA PK, DNA PK is not something that you can watch the recruitment of very effectively uh, using a laser micro irradiation, and, and part of it has to do with for every double strand break that you generate, you generate a lot of other types of damage like single strand breaks and so on and so forth, and DNA PK will respond to the double strand break. So to begin with, the number of double strand breaks that you might generate with a given laser might be lower, uh, and so as such, for an uh, enjoining factor such as DNA PK or even for Coop, uh the recruitment, observing the recruitment using this technique is a little bit tricky, but it has been done before. Mm 
uh, especially for coup, it has been done before. For DNA PK, it's still a little bit more tricky. Mm. But I would suggest using UV uh, uh, lasers for doing that uh, because that tends to cause a little bit more double strand breaks. Okay. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, the the time we have for questions. Um, I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of your questions today. But like I said, um, we can follow up with you offline. Um, I want to thank you for your participation and for submitting all of these excellent questions. Um, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Gunjan for his presentation. Um, and uh, I think this has been a very informative webinar uh, with lots of really good questions. So I also wanted to mention that, uh, as I did before, that there will be a recording of the webinar available online shortly. So uh, you will be able to see um, Dr. Gunjan's slides. Um, they'll be made public very shortly. So thank you, everyone, um, and I hope you have a great day.